Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Health Audio. My name is Theodora, and I am one of your co-hosts here on the podcast. And I'm Adrienne, your other co-host and editor of the podcast. Today, we're going to be kicking off our three-part learning disability series. For this episode, we're joined by Dr. Todd Cunningham. Dr. Todd Cunningham is an associate professor and researcher in the Applied Psychology and Human Development Department at the University of Toronto. Dr. Cunningham's research focuses on academic interventions for student-aged children who have learning difficulties. Specifically, he looks at the selection of assistive technologies to address identified academic skill deficits, increasing the effectiveness of assistive technologies, and developing learning profiles to better assist in the identification of academic intervention. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So I guess for our first warm-up question, we love to ask, um, what's your favorite experience at U of T? Well, I always find with U of T, it's kind of like going into a candy store. There's so many great opportunities that you can have and do that it's sometimes a hard time to choose the right one. What really illustrates my experience at U of T was looking at my uh, four-year-old going into a candy store in Halifax. You know, as she walked into this candy store, and her eyes almost blew out of her brain and oh my goodness, look at all these great things around me. Just couldn't believe that so many varieties of candies could be in one place. And as she was taking this in, just, just I'm sure imaging herself eating every last candy in the candy store, I then gave her the little bag and said, you can fill the, only this bag up. And then there was this kind of sense of almost... Um, anxiety that came out like oh my goodness this is so limiting of what i can do and i find that uft is kind of the same thing there's so many great opportunities out there so many neat projects colleagues to be able to collaborate with but time becomes my bag in terms of what we can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis so uft is like a candy store like any specific experiences with that like i know when i was trying to choose like a program as a first year i was like i don't know what to do so like i literally applied to every single like life science program i was eligible for and then i was like i'm gonna choose later when the results come out yeah i, I think one of the great experiences that I've had lately is really just our ability to start to apply what we've been learning in the lab to kind of our greater society. So working with governments and schools directly and actually being able to help to see how this knowledge that is developed within the labs or in kind of controlled experimental um, settings, when we apply it to kind of the greater population to just schools and school boards that we actually see the same type of results and we can actually see the change in children's lives as they're you know particularly we've been focusing on reading lately and so actually seeing kids who could not read learn how to read and how they can change in the way that they view themselves so something we call academic self-concept the way that i view myself so if i have high academic self-concept i think i'm a great student and if i have low academic self-concept i think i'm a bad student and so a lot of these students who have reading challenges early on have very low academic self-concept but by the time that they're done these programs that they feel really good they're like hey i can read i'm a great student i can do this um, and so that's really neat. That's a great experience to actually know that you are making a positive impact in children's lives. Oh, wow. That sounds really awesome. Like, I cannot imagine, like, how, how, how happy you, you felt, like, making these, like, real-life impacts and, like, seeing them happen mm -hmm. in schools around Canada. Um, so our second favorite question to ask is, I don't know if you've tried any of the food trucks on campus, but if you have, do you have a favorite? The hot dogs or sausage stand at the corner of Bloor and St. George used to be a favorite place that I would go to. But the last time I went there with my daughter and I, we kind of got a little bit of upset stomach. So we've kind of banned what we call street meat now. But uh, that was uh, for a long time a favorite place to stop, especially as a student. I used to go out there and grab grab a, a dog on 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 break so i'm also a huge fan of the hot dog stands litter across <laughs> campus my personal favorite one is the one like right in front of sid smith like that's mm. the one i usually go to yeah i'll have to watch out for that then <laughs> i've hit or miss <laughs> yeah, for, yeah maybe <laughs> we'll see when i get back to campus <laughs> all right well aside from the food truck question now we get back to so what got you to feel in your field of study um, well, I originally started off at university as a, to become a teacher. Um, so I was in the concurrent education program at Trent University. However, near the end of that program, as I was starting to do my um, work in the classrooms, I, I realized that I didn't actually know enough to be a good teacher. I felt very ill-equipped 
so I decided to kind of bail on that. I got a job at the hospital for sick children at that time, and then decided to go back and do my master's and doctorate in um, school and clinical child psychology, because I felt like there I could actually develop the deep understanding of how students go about learning, how our brains work, and emotionally, how do we learn how to regulate ourselves so that I could be much better able to help work with children who are having le learning challenges. So yeah, start off as kind of going the teacher path and decided to kind of bail to go down the psychology route. I mean, if one path doesn't work, what a, what a great path to start down on. Yeah, it was really in my undergrad. I had this fantastic uh, professor, uh, Dr. Watson's was his name, and he was a reading, um, his study was in the area of reading. And I remember in my third year and fourth year, at, at Trent, um, I was doing independent study courses with him and the wonderful typical university experience um, at Trent University, there's um, one of the colleges has a, a force behind it. We sit out behind his office on logs talking for hours about how does the brain learn how to read and the development and assessment of, of reading. And so I developed a really deep understanding and love for reading at that point. So that's why I really felt like as I went back to my teacher's college classes saying, I really, you know, I'm not getting the same depth of understanding here. Um, and so, you know, psychology seems to be providing me much more of that understanding when I took my cognitive course I learned more about learning in my cognitive course than I did in any of my curriculum development courses um, through teachers college so really felt like this was giving me that deep understanding and so yeah definitely kind of pivoted to the psychology field instead I think that's like super interesting that like every I guess like a lot of the developmental labs that I've seen or like I worked with Dr. Angela Pyle this past year on mm -hmm. her play-based learning line like everybody's focus seems to be more centered around reading in general i mean obviously like if you're illiterate that's kind of hard to navigate society um but i think it's really cool that in like particularly in like early education like that's what everyone's like really really focused on helping kids get there with reading yeah it's definitely one of the foundational skills that we have to master and if we know that a child does not master it within a given period of time then that has a real impact on the rest of their life. Individuals who have low literacy skills um, have overall poor quality of life. They're more likely to report very poor physical and poor mental health issues when they're when they're adults. They're more likely to be unemployed or not even in the workplace at, at all. Um, so literacy is is a essential skill to be able to um, thrive in our, our society. And it's also a skill that we know a lot about how to teach. However, getting that um, out into the field has been more challenging over many years at this point. So, you know, I think that's why it's such a, there's such a emphasis right now of how do we do good instruction? How do we help parents and educators know how to effectively take the principles of, of learning to read and apply it to the, the kids and the students that they're they're working with well actually that brings us perfectly to our first more serious question which is um on your work with assistive technology to start off like what is assistive technology and how do we usually see it in classrooms the first thing that we'll talk about is intervention so when you have a weakness you're not great at something there's kind of two ways we can address it either a we can use what known as remediation, kind of try and fix the underlying problem, make you better at it. Or the second one is compensatory, which is kind of bypassing it. Assistive technology is a compensatory. It's a bypass strategy for something that's kind of challenging. The main definition is it's any technology, um, commercial or developed, that can help to improve or maintain the level of functioning of someone who has a disability. So if we think of someone who is kind of um, paraplegic, you know, they're unable to use their, their legs. Before the wheelchair was invented, if they wanted to get from point A to point B, they either could A, pull themselves across the ground, a very effortful task, or B, they could ask them to pick them up and carry them from point A to point B not allowing them to have a lot of independence. Now, if we did an intervention, they could try and develop their skills. They could go like through an occupational therapist and try and develop the ability to, to walk, um, which might provide some gains. However, for certain, you know, if you had a spinal cord injury, then that's not going to help you. So then comes across the wheelchair. And then suddenly this person can get from point A to point B much more efficiently and much more independently. 
So when it comes to the area of learning and education, assistive technology is to allow students who have a underlying learning challenge to be able to more efficiently and more independently to be able to do the day-to-day -day curriculum, the day-to-day -day work that others are doing um, on their own when using that technology. So for example, if I have a reading disability, the, the primary issue with reading disabilities is actually the connection between language and, and the symbols, the letters. So there's a part of our brain here that has a hard time making these, these connections. So when I go to try and read some text off the page, I have to decode every single word. I have to translate every work very hard at translating every symbol into sound, blending those sounds together to get words to hold the meaning of those words in my mind. And in doing that, um, it's very effortful and takes a lot of en energy by the these kids and they often get burnt out and don't like to do it and they don't understand what they've done because all of their attention has gone into the trying to decode. Uh, they could have someone else read it to them, um, which doesn't provide independence, or they can have a computer read out loud to them. So we can have uh, a, an emails read out to us or our GPS talking out loud to us or Siri. It's all using the same technology that um, translates the text on the computer screen into audible speech. So that bypasses that need to decode those words. Yeah, that's a great example. I think like having things read, read out to you is helpful in a lot of ways. And sort of a relation to like technology that's been like used for disabilities. Like if we think about like fidget spinners, they kind of went for things that help people stimulate themselves to like just toys that ended up being banned in schools because they were seen as distracting. Have some assistive, assistive technologies been marketed towards non-disabled people as well? And do you think this is like a good thing or a bad thing? Actually, most of our assistive technology has been hijacked by mainstream world these days. Like, so Texas Speech initially developed for the blind um, and re reading challenges in individuals is now basically mainstream everywhere. We have everything talking to us. And anytime you hear Siri or Google or your GPS talking to you, it's actually using that same underlying technology, text to speech, just translating text in the background into audible speech. So, so we're all using it. We're all using voice recognition, the ability to talk. So students who had writing challenges, often we used to have them be able to dictate to the computer. And everybody thought this was amazing back in like the 2000 and 2005. Wow. We all talked to Google these days and, you know, constantly we're using voice recognition. Word prediction. So originally developed for individuals who had motor issues or who had spelling issues. This is where you type out the word and it kind of guesses at what word you're trying to write. Amazing technology developed actually at Bloorview Macmillan Center here in uh, Toronto. But now it's on all of our smartphones. So again, something um, that is being hijacked by, by everybody. So often when we look at the technology these days, the only thing that makes assistive technology assistive technology is when it's in the application of helping someone with a disability. Otherwise, it's the technology that we're all using. There's nothing that's, you know, there's hardly anything really in the education world that's really just been developed for education as, as a, a standalone for a person with a disability. A lot of this, most, the majority of it is all mainstream technology that we're all using. That's actually really cool. Um, I remember reading like a Q and A you did for someone and like you were talking about how a lot of people think assistive technology may be like a form of cheating for students. Um, mm. Do you think because a lot of this technology we all use today, like the stigma for students using these assistive technologies have gone down? No, because in if you go to any typical elementary classroom, you don't actually see a lot of it being used, you know. Um, mm. Well, it might change after COVID when everybody's now used computers all day long. But um, typically, no, you don't see a lot of technology being used with it within these classrooms. And so a kid to have a laptop in the classroom actually becomes kind of stigmatizing, as well as there's a poor understanding I find in our education system of how to effectively use the assistive technology um, in the classroom. Pre-pandemic, uh, often we'd see a child has their computer that can read to them, but the teacher still hands out the, the worksheets and it's not in the computer. So suddenly, you know, they have their tool here, but they can't use it. It's kind of like you give the child the wheelchair, but you forget to take away this, you know, there's still stairs at the front of the school. Um, you haven't put them in the ramp. So there's a lot of barriers that have always been present around the assistive technology that has made it very hard for students to engage um, or actually use it on a day-to-day. -day. And because of that, 
it continues to be stigmatizing for a, a lot of them because they'd be the only one using it in, in the classroom, as well as um, it, it wasn't necessarily available to do the work that they wanted to do so they couldn't actually see the benefits um, of, of that, that technology. Interesting, one of my um, uh, doctoral students, uh, Ram, when she was doing looking at these issues, and one of the big ones that came out is power cords. Here's just not being charged. So again, if you need to use it and the computer is dead, then that's, that's a huge issue or internet connectivity. A lot of our new technologies these days requires really good internet connectivity. However, in a lot of our schools, there's still actually poor internet, wireless internet connectivity. And so the, you know, the, the programs would take forever to, to activate and load. And so the student would be like, I'm not gonna wait two and a half minutes to get this thing going. I'll just do it the old fashioned way. Un unaided. So yeah, no, there's still a lot of issues out, out there. It'll be interesting to see post pandemic if that has rectified itself at all with all everybody using a lot more technology, but um, but yeah, we'll have to see. I can probably maybe foresee like the worksheet issue being like resolved a little more because like teachers have been using online worksheets the entire year. So like if someone really needed like text to speech, the, the teacher mm -hmm. probably already has like an online version of the document. But like for things like power cords and Wi-Fi, like I feel like that's like a school funding issue. And considering COVID has cut a lot of funding, I really don't see that being like immediately solved anytime soon. Yes. Yeah. Moving on to a little bit about post-secondary education, considering, you know, Adrian and I are in um, our undergraduate degree. We wanted to know about like how would how do you think your assistive technology uh, selection protocol can be implemented and would you think it's like an accessibility thing? Like, do you think, obviously like undergrad has like 60,000 students here at UFT. Like, do you think it would be, we, we would be able to implement it like on a widespread level, like give it to every single student? Yeah, so the assistive technology selection program protocol or atselect.com, we developed that because what we were seeing in the education system is the same kind of five or six assistive technology tools being given to everybody. And it didn't make sense. Um, you know, there's almost 400 different assistive technology products out there these days. And to see the same five of them recommend over and over and over again for the diversity within learning didn't, didn't equate. So the first thing we have to understand when it comes to the assistive technology selection protocol, there's a difference between assistive technology tool and assistive technology um, program. For example, um, when it comes to um, word processors, word processor is a tool and word processors have many different types of tools. So, so Microsoft Word is a program and within that program, um, they have the word processor tool, they have the spell check tool, they have the formatting tool, they have the envelope tool. Microsoft Word has almost um, 180 different tools built into it. There's even a tool in there that will actually identify the main ideas within your text or even read that text out loud to you. It even has voice recognition these days. So there's a lot of really cool tools built into this one product. So often what we found is when it came to assistive technology, basically they're just referring the same products to everybody. So what we wanted to do is say, no, that that's the wrong way. We What we want to do is we want you to focus on the specific tool. You don't need to know all 180 five different tools within Microsoft Word, you might need to only know two or three of those tools within Microsoft Word to be able to use it really effectively. And so what the assistive technology protocol does is works you through a kind of a bunch of decision steps that you have to do. The first one is you kind of have to think about what is the core area of challenges I'm having? Is it reading, writing, organization? Is it attention? Mathematics? Then when you open up into one of those core areas, it lists all of the sub skills that you have to do. So in the area of reading, if we are able to look at reading, you have the ability to decode quickly and accurately, and you have the ability to understand what you're reading. So those are the two primary skills that you have to master within, within reading. And if you're saying, okay, I'm having difficulties with the, the coding and the ability to recognize those words quickly and accurately, then here are a, a number of different assistive technology tools that I could use. So I can click onto one of those tools, which might be audiobooks. You know, hey, if I can't read the text, then have the text read out loud to me. Or another one could be text-to-speech. I could have the text on the computer screen and the computer will read that um, text out loud to me. And so then once you do that, you can learn about the different tools, how to use them effectively, and then here have a whole bunch of different products that you can do. So the idea is to help students or teachers or parents to be able to say, 
where is that area of weakness that my child's having or that student's having or I'm having? And then what is a specific tool that can begin to help me resolve that issue, bypass the, that, that issue so that I can be able to do things more, more effectively. In undergrad and graduate school, um, one of the big areas is organization. A lot of individuals have hard times with this doing the planning and keeping on task. And so in the area of organization, in the area about kind of time management and kind of monitoring of, of, of our time. So we get a lot of students who come and see us and they say, you know what, I, I meant to write the essay last night. You know, I went home, I opened up, you know, Microsoft Word, I, I read the question and I, I started to write on, you know, I started try, trying to get some ideas down. And after an hour, I only had five things on, on the page. Of course, my question is, well, how did you spend that actual hour? Like, what did you actually do? And they're like, I don't know. So we can install a program called Rescue Timer on your computer. And what Rescue Timer does is actually show you moment to moment what you're doing on your computer. So we can then say, okay, during that hour, you spent 10 minutes in Microsoft Word. You spent, you know, 45 minutes, um, you know, playing Minecraft. And then you came back for the last 10 minutes and did a little bit more writing on your essay. So in that hour, you're actually only on task for about, you know, 20% of the time. So it makes sense you didn't get that much done. So, so that, that's the way to be able to distract time. Going back to um, what I call the white screen of death, you know, when you open up Microsoft Word to start your essay for the very first time and you have like this white screen there, you're like, I don't have a clue where to begin. There's another really cool set of technologies um, in the area of writing. Um, called idea generation. So whenever we go to write, there's kind of five things we have to go through. First, we have to think about what we're going to do. That's kind of generate the ideas. We have to organize those ideas into um, the, the flow of it. We have to actually write those those ideas, turn them those ideas into sentences and paragraphs. Then we have to edit that stuff, and then we have to review it to make sure it's all good. So the thinking one is actually one of the hardest skills that we, we run into because a lot of students are coming to a, a subject and they don't have a lot of background knowledge. They don't have a lot of expertise on this topic that they're just about to start to write about, especially in undergrad. And so there's a set of technology out there called idea generators. So you put in these your idea that you want to do it, and it basically creates a lexicon, a list of related ideas for you. And so you can see how ideas are um, connected. So you can go and research some of those other ideas. And, and so it can help you kind of start to develop that kind of those, those, those initial thoughts that you have on how to go about writing your, your essay. So idea generation software is another wonderful assistive technology tool that can help so many different um, students out there. That sounds really cool. Like I definitely will need rescue time. I, I definitely need to see where my time's been going. Um, I just have like a question on using the website that you mentioned to like get recommended like a tool you need. Like for teachers, do they have to first identify like the student skill like deficit beforehand? Or could it could a student just go on the website and be like, I want to know where I'm left? Well, you can just go in there and go, you know what? I okay, when it comes to writing, here are all these different skills. I kind of am good at that one. I'm not good at these ones. I can just go and click on them and, and learn about it. You don't have to go through any formal assessment process. You can just kind of start digging around and seeing what part of your academic skills seem to be causing you a little bit more challenge. Um, and, and especially by graduate school, you have a much better understanding of what you can and can't do. So um, most students, again, it's reading fluency, how fast you can read and understand. Vocabulary is a big one, um, especially for a lot of students who are linguistically diverse. We, we teach in English most of the time, so having the vocabulary. So there's some really good vocabulary tools um, out there that can help students. We know that if you don't know three to 5% of, of the words in a paragraph, you don't understand that paragraph. So vocabulary is a key one for, for a lot of students. Writing is a really challenging domain for a lot of students in terms of the writing and organization. So there's a lot of really neat tools out there. Essay Jack is another really great writing one. It helps to organize your essay for you. So you can go and put in your thesis statement and then it gives you all these prompts about what's your main idea, what's your supporting idea. So it creates a structure of your essay. And then in the end, you can use that structure to then export it into like Microsoft Word and be able to kind of fill in the, the sentences and paragraphs. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can just go in and explore and see, see what tools could help and try them out for a bit. And if they work, then that's great. And if not, try, try something else. Well, okay. That actually like really answers my question about like how people could use it in post-secondary education. Because I thought like they needed like some assessment and there would be like some barriers to accessibility. But if it's just like 
the teacher providing like the prof providing like a website for students to go and like explore the tools then like that's definitely accessible to literally everybody on campus on atselect.org when you land there um at the very top is you know the the menu bar go to tech by skills is that is a good place to start off on the tech by skills and it will bring you up all the key academic domains that you have and then click on an academic domain and it will take you into the sub skills that make up that domain which will then lead you to the technologies that are out, out there that was so great i didn't know how many resources there were out there I, I would definitely check out the writing one i got so stuck on essays as well in relation to the work that you do um, another thing you've been working on is telepsychology for students in remote communities so what is telepsychology so telepsychology is providing support um, through <laughs> through video conferencing or uh, remote conferencing so instead of being in physically in the same place with each other um, we can do it remotely now before COVID, this was a really cool novel idea like oh my goodness using zoom to be able to talk to people in northern communities and be able to share work i think we're all doing it so much these days that it, it really doesn't have its uh, initial uh, appeal or it's not not as novel as it, it once was but what we're doing is working with schools in um, remote northern communities uh, many indigenous ones where we were providing school psychology support it had a, a couple key things one um it, it's a great training platform for our um, clinical students to be able to work in environments and with communities that are very diverse from um, the ones that they usually get exposed to in southern um, ontario but it also was providing an essential service to um, schools that otherwise did not have access to school psychology support and so what we do is we we had kind of two phases to the program. The first phase is on a weekly basis, um, the, the doctoral students and myself would connect with the teachers and we would, through video conferencing, we'd be able to work through challenging cases that the teachers were having. So students that they were working with in, in the classroom, we'd be able to see examples of, of their work and be able to provide guidance on kind of next steps. And we could track them over a course of eight, eight weeks. We always did kind of these eight week um, blocks on, on a specific problem. Um, the second phase then was for cases that we couldn't resolve, then each year we would fly into a community and we'd actually work one-on-one -on -one with, with those students and then be able to gather them more in-depth information through the assessments that we did. And then afterwards, we'd then go back to the video conferencing where we'd continue to provide them with more up-to-date um, and targeted interventions that the teachers could use for, for those students. And um, again, continue to follow them over the course of the year. So really it was just taking the type of practices that we did in Southern Ontario, which we were doing face-to-face -face, and we were doing them remotely. Now, when we started this back in 2000 and I think it was about 2012, um, video conferencing was a very different thing. I was working with a group of the IT technicians here at U of T, and I was up in one of the remote communities. And, and at the time, that community could only connect to the internet via satellite dishes. And we spent a day working on trying to get everything connected in a way to actually see other and by the end of the day there was like this aha moment where for the first time I, I could see them and they could see us we had gotten we had reconfigured all the hardware uh, we found the right program so that we could actually connect together that was amazing to actually do that for the very first time now again fast forward to today we're still doing that but the technology is so much better the infrastructure is so much better so we're not writing into nearly the challenges that we did eight years ago. Yeah, I can imagine. It's kind of, it's funny to think back how like novel and amazing it, it felt like completely using Skype for the first time when I was a kid to now it's like just the norm. Mm -hmm. I think like as we move into the future, how do you think um, telepsychology and telehealth will evolve even further? I think the one thing the pandemic really brought about is the need for these services to be well developed because so much of well, in um, Ontario alone, only, oh, shoot, I'm going to get the stat right, but there's a big percentage, I think it's around 20 to 30% of our society is not close to any psychological providers. So there's a lot of this, our society that doesn't have direct connection to good mental health um, provisions. So we need these services to be able to reach out to them. Most school psychologists um, kind of live below Barrie and, and, and Southern 
south of that, uh, with Th Thunder Bay, North Bay having some. But really, again, there's a large part of our province that is not um, served. What we have now is both a, a tested system to know how we can be able to both assess and provide um, consultation and, and therapeutic interventions. We have training that's going on to, on how to use these systems, and we have developed services around them. So I think post-pandemic, we will better be able to serve much more of Ontario than we had in, in the past. And that's the exciting piece for me around the telepsychology services is just seeing how this is actually matured to a point where we are now using it on a day-to-day -day basis. And for a lot of, and there's a lot in Southern Ontario families who say, hey, I don't want to deal with Toronto traffic. I would rather do a consultation remotely than having to go spend 45 minutes in the car trying to come to your office. So I, I do think we're going to see kind of this hybrid approach where we continue to use these services to be able to reach out for either ease or just general access, but still have one-on-one -on -one times or in-person uh, abilities for when we do need those either through certain types of assessments or interventions that, that are required. Yeah, it's a great thing about the future. And I definitely agree with like not having to commute is pretty nice. Moving back to um, post-secondary students, what do you think like are some some of the most common learning disabilities that post-secondary students face? Well, it comes to reading uh, learning disabilities. Uh, the, the most common are in the area of reading and writing, and, and the reason is they actually um, the same neural circuitry that in, impacts reading also impacts writing, and actually bits of math. So about 80% of reading disabilities and our writing disabilities um, are are joint, and for undergrad and post-secondary that's where we're going to see the big one. It's actually in the ability to keep up with the day-to-day -day readings is the main weakness that a lot of students talk about. They just can't, you know, in high school, they had about this much reading they had to do every single night. In university, you have about this much reading you have to do every single night. And when you aren't fluid in reading, when, when reading is an effortful and slow task, then you just can't keep up with all that reading and understanding. And so therefore, that is kind of the primary weakness that a lot of individuals first are, are encountering with. The second one is then being able to express their ideas in the written format. So being able to write essays um, becomes the next big one because you might have all these great ideas out there, but again, if you're having a hard time with spelling or you're very slow with handwriting or, or typing, then getting those ideas out on paper really well um, is, is very effortful again. And you don't, you can't demonstrate the same type of understanding that you have on the paper. So that's the second area that we, we see is, is in within writing. So being able to keep up with the reading and then also to be able to do express your learning through the writing. Then we get into more of the sub areas, which is more around organization. There's a lot of students who struggle with organization, just keeping on top of things. Now that could be due to A, I'm having so hard time with reading, I just can't keep up with the work, or it might be due to an, uh, like a neurodevelopmental challenge where you're having a hard time sustaining your attention and keeping all the facts, uh, all your dates in mind, or being able to deal with executive functioning, the planning, organization, monitoring of your work. And so you just are getting stuff. So organization has a lot of different pieces that, that come into it. But I think one of the biggest ones that come out of this is, again, it's more of their academic self-concept that they just feel like they just can't do it. And so a sense of burnout and giving up can kind of give, gives them. There's a really interesting study that was done back at Trent University that looked at students who had learning disabilities. And the first thing is, if you have a learning disability and you get to university, awesome. Um, around 60% of the general population goes on to some sort of, um, you know, college or, or university, whereas in the LD population, only around about 8% of the LD population goes on to post-secondary or in, either to college or university. So not represented there. Um, so if you get there, uh, first thing, absolutely amazing. Once you're there um, and you can make it through, what was found is students who were successful at university, their ability to regulate their, um, what we call kind of emotional IQ, um, their understanding of um, how to regulate themselves, how to deal with frustrating challenges, how to prioritize and plan was off the charts because they've had to develop all of these other skills to be able to deal with the day-to-day -day frustration of the academic life versus those who had have not. So those are all then critical skills to develop kind of going into it. So it's both, one, it's understanding themselves. So, so understanding their learning profile. So self-awareness is the ability to advocate. So being able to tell others about their learning profile 
and why they need certain accommodations. So if I need to be able to have a bit more time on a test to write it, or I need to have a computer read me my test, why that's important um, for it. Then it's the ability to keep in mind that I need a support network around me to usually help it. So accessibility services, other friends to be able to help me to work around my areas of challenges. It's to keep the goal in mind of where I'm going in life so that um, kind of the eye on, on the prize. So instead of getting bogged down by just trying to get through the next essay, knowing that that little essay is just a stepping stone towards where I have to go. But it's also being flexible to get to that final goal. So maybe most students do, you know, um, undergrad in three to four years, maybe I take five years to do it, but that's okay. Or maybe I have to do my statistics course in the summer because that gives me more time to focus on, on that one course that I'm, I'm kind of concerned about. So it's being flexible and getting to that goal. And then the last one is again, that kind of emotional regulations of perseverance and being able to um, understand that frustrating times are going to come up, but they are not going to continue on. You know, I can work through this. I have strategies. I have my support network. I can be able to deal with these frustrations and persevere to be able to meet with those goals. So these kind of key skills for success are also vital to kind of develop over the time um, at, at university. If you do that, then you know, again, you're much better set at the end. An interesting study came out uh, several years ago. There's been kind of this idea that for students who have like reading disabilities, often called dyslexia, that there's kind of gift around kids or individuals who have dyslexia. And what the study showed was there's not, not a specific gift, but what was there is people who had dyslexia or reading um, disability is they're more willing in to be able to ask for help. So they're looking at all these entrepreneurs, um, some who had dyslexia and others who, who, who did not. And they found that those who had dyslexia, these reading disabilities, they were more likely to develop their teams faster, bigger teams, whereas those who didn't have dyslexia, they kept them they just did it on their self. They tried it themselves. And those who built teams, they were more likely to be successful. Those entrepreneurs were more likely to achieve success faster than those who just did it on their own. And so this idea of seeing that I need a support network, I need these others to kind of help is actually an uh, advantage um, often to, to individuals than just think of feeling like I can do this on my own. Being diagnosed later in life, um, how do you think it's different? From helping those that were diagnosed in their teens rather than as a, than as a child? For again, the kind of the 80% of learning disabilities were reading and writing are the primary issues. We know that we need to diagnose those really early. And there's a real push right now to do um, diagnosis or at least identification in kindergarten diagnosis as early as possible because we know that if we intervene by the end of grade one, we can get about an 80% remediation rate. So we can correct the problem for 80% of those who are in grade one, about 50% if it's in grade two, and kind of 30% if it's grade three. And we don't know what happens after that. So there's a reduction in the rate of return of our effects of remediation as a person gets older. So early identification intervention is essential within the field. I think those who don't get diagnosed till later until they're adults, they've really developed perseverance because somehow they have been able to beat a system that is really stacked against them from K to 12. And I think when they do get diagnosed in university or as an adult, there's a real aha moment like, oh, that makes a lot of sense why this has been so hard for me all the way along. Now, again, those individuals are, are um, far and few between because most students who have those types of challenges actually leave school around grade 10. Um, they start to drop out of school, so they don't get to college or, or university. So it's, it's wonderful if they make it there. And I think when they get those assessments, it's a real aha moment. It's like, why, why has life been so darn hard for me? And now I have something I can, I can kind of pin it to it. So there's also a piece that kind of takes the blame off of myself, like some, you know, there was something like I wasn't trying hard enough, or, you know, I was smart enough to this understanding of no, there's actually a really good neurological reason for why this was hard for, for me. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it's great to find out something about yourself. It can probably form a lot of self hate when you think you're just not trying hard enough. So I can imagine. I think mm -hmm. so the importance of diagnosis kind of leads me to like, what do you think that, um, what are some steps that people can take if they suspect they have a learning disability? If you look at your peers around you and you find that on a day-to-day -day basis, you're putting forth a lot more effort than they are, 
um, and you're not seeming to get the same type of returns that you'd expect for that effort that you put forth, then I think it's very, you know, it's important to reach out to the Accessibility Services Office at, at UFT to be able to find out, hey, you know, meet, meet with a counselor and talk about your history, you know, for most individuals, we, we look for what we call impairment, you know, where something is significantly weaker in, you know, an academic skill that's significantly weaker than compared to others. So is it how fast you read, how well you can write? And that impairment has to have a history. It's not like I started grade or I took first year calculus and um, suddenly I had, you know, I'm not doing well in calculus, but yet all the way in life I've been doing well in math. You know, that doesn't immediately make me have a math disability. That just means I'm not good at calculus, you know, and for all of us, there's things that we're good at and some things we're not so good at. And so maybe calculus is not the right thing for me to be, be doing. However, if you have a history of always having challenges with math, and now you're trying to take out this and can you calculus is continuously providing you with uh, ch challenges. And then you can say, hey, ever since I was, you know, in grade three, grade four, or in grade five or six, you know, I've had a history of math issues, then you can say, yeah, maybe there's some something here and we can, we, we should kind of do an assessment to, to look at that. So just because you're having difficulties in this moment with something doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a, a you know, there's an underlying disability. It's really, I've struggled with this area all my life or most of my life. And, you know, it's really at a point where I just can't keep up anymore. That's when it's really a good to look into, you know, talking to the accessibility officers to find out, hey, is there something more? Is there an explanation of why this has always been hard for me? I just wanted to put in my two cents about like getting diagnosed later in life, like not to expose myself, but I was very, very recently diagnosed with inattentive ADHD. And like, I never really thought, like I've had like multiple instances through like my social life and personal life that definitely indicated I had this problem, but because I was very academically advanced. No one was like, yo, you might have like a disability or like you might have a problem. It wasn't until like university where like my executive dysfunction kind of was like super out of control that like I actually like looked up the symptoms and kind of like talked to accessibility and talked to psychologists about it. So like if you have a suspicion, I don't want you to mm -hmm. self-diagnose, but like maybe do a little bit of research and then talk to people. Yeah, and, and it's something like like inattentive ADHD. You know, if we always say we have strengths and challenges. So if your strengths are really high, then you can compensate a lot of time for for these other areas of weaknesses, and you can do that for a long time until the the level of demand hits a critical point where you just you just can't do that. You know, the the, the weaknesses do begin to present present themselves. But often, again, in those situations, you, you kind of start looking over your history and you go, yes, I've always seen that this weakness has been there. I've just been able to work around it. And now I have kind of hit the brick wall and I can't keep doing this. I think that that does bring me to my next question, because for someone like Theodora, getting diagnosed must have been pretty hard. But like, do you think like the diagnosis of learning disabilities has like changed over time or gone better? In terms of her, Perceptions, I, I think it's getting better, you know, but I do still think that um, the term itself is kind of a bit problematic. So when you hear learning disability, often I think people think about they have a disability in learning, they can't learn, which is far from the truth. These individuals can learn lots of stuff. So it's not a disability in learning. It really is about uh, what we now know is a very specific area of, of challenge that we can intervene and be able to do something if we can identify it early or later in line we can use the compensatory stuff such as assistive technology to be able to work around that area of weakness the first thing is there was a interesting survey done a couple of years ago when they were surveying it was a canadian survey asking people do you know what a learning disability is and the vast majority of people just have never heard of the term so it's not a well understood term out there in the general population and then for those who do understand or have heard of it what they often have is this kind of older conception of these kids who just can't learn. And again, that's not our understanding. It's a very specific neural region that, that's usually getting um, in the way. So now where we're at is trying to help educate the, the population in, in understanding, especially the education population of you know, what, what exactly this is, what does it mean? And it doesn't mean that these people can't learn. It just means we have to do things a little bit differently for, for the, the, this population. Is there like an alternative name that people like you who work in the field use for students? Or do you just still go with learning? No, it, it, it is, you know, um, it is the key 
term that we use. So in Ontario, we, we call it learning disabilities in the area of reading, writing, or mathematics. Again, in some places, they call it dyslexia for the reading-based le learning disability or dyscalculia when it's in the area of math or dysgraphia if it's in handwriting. So there are other terms out there, but in Ontario, the core, the main one is, is learning disability. As someone who was recently diagnosed, I feel like the word disability kind of feels a little harmful to some people because when you tell someone you have a disability, like they're like, oh no, like are you severely impaired or like they immediately jump to like person in a wheelchair or something like that. So mm -hmm. like because of the lack of education, I feel like a lot of people are a lot less willing to disclose they have these types of issues or even like go towards seeking help because like they don't want that form of a label or whatnot. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of stigma attached to people who have disabilities, unfortunately. Um, and there's not a good understanding of the natural diversity within our, our population and why we, we need this. And, and really, the only reason something becomes a disability is because our society has deemed a certain skill essential. Like when I sing, I, I'm a lousy singer. And you know, my, in my two year, when she was two, she used to put her hand over my mouth, and say, no, daddy, don't, no. <laughs> so she, you know, so, but I don't have a, a singing disability because our society hasn't deemed singing as kind of this critical skill to be able to do well. So there's always variability within any given skill or ability out, out there. At a certain point, we've said, these are the skills that are really critical. And, and here's a threshold of when it becomes apparent when you can't be able to, to do that. And that's what we have deemed a, a disability. So a disability is really a socially constrived construct. You take your inattention, you know, and you go into another environment, having sustained attention on something for a long period of time might have been a hindrance if you were in forestry or something like that, where you're needing to take in the environment around you much, much more and attending to every piece. So, so again, it, it is the environment that we create, it's the societal constraints that we put on that really create certain skills or, or abilities and, and bring them to the forefront. That's a really good way of like helping me frame it or helping whoever's listening frame it because I actually never really thought of it as like a societal standard. Like, oh yeah, you're considered bad at reading because of like, oh, a certain standard that we have set by society. Like if we were back in like hunter-gatherer days, like reading is not really essential, so. No, like, like reading like, really only came on the, about 150 years ago, it became essential that we start learning how to, to read. You know, before that you had uh, someone would model to you, you you'd been an apprentice and that person would have shown you how to do it. You didn't have to read. It really is the, these core skills, these core academics have really only become essential in the last 150 years of our societies. I'm going to be honest, like, I don't think I would have gotten a diagnosis if it wasn't for COVID because of the increasing amounts of online classes, asynchronous classes. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just drowning and, like, I couldn't pick myself up, which is, like, how I ended up getting a diagnosis because with in-person classes, I had figured out a really great way for me to pay attention, but mm -hmm. that doesn't work online. Trying to sit in the front row and, like, interact with the professor doesn't really work when it's a video. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got diagnosed, like maybe like barely two months ago. So, yeah. you know, like going into the next school year, like I'll probably, I definitely have more support and resources. And like for anyone who's listening, like no shame in doing it. Like I've always been really high achieving and I was really afraid to go in. But like when you think you see that you need help, like it's definitely something that you should, you know, ask for. Like as Dr. Cunningham said, like people with dyslexia were able to ask for more help and build their teams fast. Think of it as a positive. You'll have better support and more people to help you. So that might be all the time we have. Thanks so much for coming on. I think we've gotten like all our questions answered and then some really interesting points brought up. Yeah, well, well thank you very yeah. much for having me and thank you for talking about such an important issue. There's a lot of individuals who are out there who are struggling more than they, they need to. And we live in a very exciting time in education. We have now the knowledge of being able to how to accurately assess and identify these areas of weaknesses. We have both these wonderful interventions about trying to remediate, but also the compensatory, the assistive technology out there that can help to be able to work around and make school easier and so really when it comes to education people shouldn't be feeling that they're struggling as hard as some people are and so really encourage you if you are in that place to seek out those, those supports before we go i just wanted to reiterate like if y'all want to go check out the website that dr cunningham mentioned it is atselect.org 
and you should probably go check out tech by skills um, which is a great place to start